Unity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on the line of fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. I have to admit, this statement surprised me. When I heard it in Poland, when I heard it at the Polish Museum of the Jewish People in Warsaw, the statement surprised me that there is no Polish history without the Jews. There is no Jewish history without Poland. Welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire. Michael Brown here. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Welcome to all those tuning in for the first time. If you have a Jewish-related question of any kind, if you're a Jewish person, maybe a traditional Jew, you happen to tune in, you heard about the show, and you can't believe here's a Jewish man who says he believes Jesus is the Messiah, and you want to talk to me about it, give me a call. 866-34-TRUTH. Maybe you're a devoted Christian and you're wondering about some passages in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, or you've got a question about Judaism or Jewish tradition, or maybe you're a Muslim and you've got some issues about the modern state of Israel. Phone lines are open. As long as it's Jewish-related, whether you agree with me or differ with me, that's not the issue. It's your question that we want to get to, 866-348-7884. The earlier in the broadcast you call, the better chance we have of getting to your call a little bit later in the show. Also just got news uh, about the new leader of Italy, the newly elected prime minister, the first woman. Not only is she a strong conservative who openly identifies as Christian, as mother, as female, which these days is big, <clears throat> but apparently she's also a strong supporter of Israel. Just found that out moments before the show started. I'll talk to you about that in a little while. Okay, so as many of you know, I was in Poland this past weekend, and the believers there said uh, it would be really good if you could schedule time to go to the Jewish Museum in Poland, in, in Warsaw. And I'd never heard of that. In fact, it's only about eight years old, I think. And one of the members of the church where I was speaking was the principal fundraiser, Christian woman, to bring in millions of dollars from around the world, especially from the Jewish community around the world, to build this museum. So it's, it's major, it's historic, and the fact that it was built with the help of Christians is of great importance. But when I would think of, of Poland, uh, friends of mine that have, that have been to Poland and wanted to do Jewish-related tour, of course, they would go to Auschwitz. And uh, hopefully in a, in a future trip, I can do that, although I, you've got to be emotionally prepared to do something like that because of the impact that it can have being in a place like that where so much evil took place, so much unimaginable suffering. But I, I have to admit that I had a bit of a, a blind spot in, in my own knowledge of Jewish history in Poland. Now, now, here's what I knew. The overwhelming thing when I think of Poland and Jewish history, the overwhelming thing that comes to mind immediately is this. Before the Holocaust, there were 3.3 million Jews in Poland. Three million were slaughtered. Three million. This is the highest percentage in any of these countries where Jews live. Over 90 percent, over nine in 10 of every Jewish families, individuals, slaughtered by the Nazis. It's, it's devastating. As, as I was on one of these shuttle trains at Heathrow Airport, going back uh, from, from Poland, going back, uh, to, going back home, one, one of the transit buses I was on, I just looked around and thought, okay, nine out of every 10 wiped out. Or you, families that you know, neighborhoods you know, communities that you know, friends that you know, nine out of every 10 wiped out. Unimaginable. So I, I knew that. And then I, I knew that there were significant rabbis that were Polish and significant Jewish communities in Polish history. I, I, I knew that. All right. But what I didn't piece together, the, the obvious was there was a reason that there were so many Jews in Poland. In other words, it had been a favorable place for Jews to live. I, it was the obvious, but I just didn't think about it because half of the six million Jews who were killed in the Holocaust were, were Polish Jews. Right. So why were so many living in Poland? I only thought of the aftermath and the residue of Catholic anti-Semitism that was there that resulted in further horror stories for some of the survivors of the Holocaust, which I'll come to in a moment. But I, I didn't stop to ask what was so favorable about Poland for so long 
as I went on the tour of the museum, a, a guided tour by, by their top tour guide and uh, a, accompanied by a, a one of the pastors from the church that had done a lot of study uh, and Jewish history and things like that, and the woman in the church that had raised the funds for the museum. So that was the, the guided tour I had with the three of them. Uh, as, as, as we went around, there was, there was just so much to, to learn. And for example, we're standing there where the, where the museum is built. It's, it's on the, the area that was formerly the Warsaw Ghetto, built over the rubble of what was once the Warsaw Ghetto. I didn't know that there were 600 ghettos that the Nazis set up all over Poland. I didn't know that in Warsaw, one out of every three homes before the Holocaust was Jewish. I didn't know that there were 1,200 synagogues. I, I didn't know that before. So again, I had, I had some knowledge of some of these things, but the specifics, the details, but more, more importantly, the, the favorable history. That's the part I was just somewhat blind to it because of the devastation of the Holocaust and the aftermath being so horrific, being so overwhelming that it's difficult to think back to, well, why were so many Jews living there in the first place? And why was it good for Poland and good for the Jewish people? To the point to repeat that it was said to me uh, at, at the museum that there is no Polish history without the Jews and there is no Jewish history without Poland. All right, so the, the, the Warsaw Ghetto was the, the biggest, the most notorious of the ghettos established by the Nazis where Jews were herded together, cut off from the outside world and lived on starvation diets. You say, what's a starvation diet? 300 calories a day, 300 calories a day. And, and it was there that finally there was the uprising as the Jews decided to fight back, but with almost no weaponry and, and against impossible odds, of course, wiped out, devastated. But that was pretty much them saying, we're going to die in our terms, similar to Masada, as, as was shared at the tour, you know, to think in those terms. We're going to die on our terms. And you kill us, go ahead, but we, we've chosen to die this way rather than to die slowly of disease or, or exterminated in a concentration camp or of starvation here. So Nazis wanted to make an example. And also because there was an uprising within Warsaw itself, there were Poles who fought back against the Nazis, and Poland lost 3 million. So 3 million out of what? Maybe 38 million versus 3 million out of 3.3 million, Polish population versus Jewish population. But still, in Polish memory, 3, 000, 3 million Jews were killed, 3 million Poles were killed, and the Poles were killed rising up against the Nazis. So that's why Warsaw was so completely leveled and devastated. The Nazis were going to demonstrate, the Nazis were going to make clear that this is what happens to resistance. And if you helped a Jewish family, it was death penalty. I know it's easy for us to say, well, I would have stood up. I'm a Christian. I would have stood up for the Jewish people. Hopefully so. But when the penalty is death for you and your family, it's easier said than done. It's, it's, it's a whole lot harder to, to say, okay, I'm going to have my whole family slaughtered because I'm going to help a Jewish neighbor. At the same time, there were different sentiments among the Polish people. The one that I was most aware of was the, the well, let the Jews be killed. Not our business, not our problem. Or, well, they're Christ killers, they deserve it. That would be the most extreme in, in the anti-Semitic sentiments in, in Catholic and Protestant homes. But here, Poland is a Catholic country, would have been in Catholic homes. So that was there. That was there for sure. In fact, Marty Waldman, one of my friends, uh, Messianic Jewish rabbi in Dallas, Texas, uh, I met his dad years ago. His dad's with the Lord now. But his dad was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, an absolutely horrific story uh, among millions of horrific stories. The Nazis rounded up the, the men. They were ready to, to kill them. And they said, we need a tailor. Does anyone hear a tailor? Well, he was a tailor. He raised his hand. Okay, well, um, he has two best <laughs> friends, his lifelong friends. They're there, right? Well, he wants to say, well, I, I, need, I need two assistants. You can have one. Pick one. So think of that. You get your two lifelong friends, so you got to pick one. Well, you can't have two. You pick one. So that's devastating. He's got to give a death sentence to one of his friends. Well, he survives, and a handful of his friends survive the Holocaust. They go back to one of the houses that's vacant, 
they've got what are they going to do i mean there's there's a, you're just devastated they're sitting around playing cards and some of the neighbors found out that some jews survived and and started shooting at them they ran into the woods and just kept running that's that's how they ultimately survived post holocaust when i told that to 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 uh one of the women at at the museum one of the christian women when i told her that she said i've heard hundreds of stories like that hundreds of stories like that so that's part of the memory. There are others that just didn't get involved, hated to see what was happening, but didn't get involved. But others said, these are my neighbors, these are my friends, and they fought. And, and they died fighting for the Jewish people. The Christians that I was with were great lovers of, of Israel, great lovers of the Jewish people, and wanted to emphasize to me that through much of Polish history, there was great tolerance that you could go back five, six hundred years in Polish history and find clear edicts of religious tolerance, and Jews will not be persecuted, and Jews will not be exiled from, from this country because of their religious faith, and they were free to practice it. So there was a lot more religious tolerance in much of the history, and there's a Jewish tradition that said as the Jews were wandering, exiled from other countries, uh, they found this place, Polin. There is a place of, of rest and abiding. And then that, that was, they were looking for that place and they found it. So it was a nice place to stay. And although there was discrimination at times and although they were treated as second class citizens, for much of the history, there was tolerance, which is why there was such a large Jewish community there for so long. That's the part that should have been obvious. There was a reason they were there. But because of the devastating Holocaust history and after that, it's a part of the history I really didn't know about. I was sent back with this gorgeous volume, all pictures, 1,000 1, years. That's how far back it goes. 1,000 years of Polish Jewish history. And, and look at how Satan, the devil, working through human beings, so obliterated something with such a history. Wow, there's a lot of evil that has taken place, carried out through human beings. There's also a lot of good that's been done. Noble causes, the friends, how we need a redeemer, how we need a redeemer. All right, right back with your Jewish related call. Stay right here. You know, it's plainly written in Hebrews, the 11th chapter in the sixth verse, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. You cannot please God without faith. It's written, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Well, on the one hand, this is just simple and self-evident. How are you going to pursue a God you don't believe in? How are you going to believe in a God that you don't think exists? How are you going to walk with a God that you think is a figment of someone's imagination? So on the self-evident level, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But, but there's something much deeper here. God wants us to really know him. God wants us to really lean on him. And in order to do that, because he, the invisible God, created that which is invisible, because we must look to him who is invisible. We must see the unseen. We must do that through the eye of faith. But faith is not imagination. Faith is not creating something out of thin air. Faith is, is not making believe a God exists. No, faith is taking hold of the highest reality. Faith is saying, I believe God. We see the evidence of him in our own lives. We see the evidence of him in scripture. We see the evidence of him in creation. And then we encounter him in a direct way and he leads us and guides us and speaks to us. So in order to please him, we have to trust him. You can't love him. You can't know him. You can't develop a relationship with him without trusting him. So we put our trust in God, not in some imaginary being, but in the creator of the universe and our redeemer. And as we do, and as we seek him earnestly and diligently, we watch him work and move and touch lives and change lives. And we see the reality of faith. Faith is taking hold of the highest reality, God himself, and putting our trust in him.
Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the <laughs> line of fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday on the Line of Fire. You know, one thing that we definitely plan to do on our Israel trip uh, May of next year, God willing, is, is to have some time praying together, really seeking God together, uh, praying for God's purposes for Israel and the Jewish people, and, and praying for you that God would fulfill his purposes in your life. So if if you're there, definitely want to do that one of the nights, have a special prayer time, and I believe God will draw near to us as we do. If you haven't signed up yet, we still do have seats available as we were able to free up some additional hotel space in Jerusalem. So go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, get all the details. Uh, You get to make your own flight arrangements in terms of what airlines you want to fly on and how you want to work that out. And then we cover everything on the ground. So it gives you more flexibility. We all meet up at a certain time and and then take you through everything from soup to nuts, and you are in perfect hands. And then when you go, get back home uh, the way you set it up best for yourself. So check out the details on the website. But the sooner you sign up, the better, because seats are limited. All right. Also, if you haven't explored our new massively revamped, this brand-new website, askdrbrown.org, and our brand new Jewish outreach website, realmessiah.com, which you can link by just clicking on Jewish there on the website, askdrbrown.org. Check it out. You'll be enriched. You'll be blessed. And the Real Messiah website, great place for Jewish seekers, great place for those wanting to grow in their understanding of Jesus being the Messiah of Israel. All right, let us go to the phones, and we start with Caleb in Wise, Virginia. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, Dr. Brown. Thank you for... Uh, taking my call, and I, I want to say real quick, I'm a son be a minister with the Assemblies of God. I'm a young guy, and you've blessed me greatly. Um, but my question is, I've been dealing with a group called the Christian Identity uh, or Christian Israel Movement that claims that uh, that uh, Germanic Anglo-Saxon people are the real Jews, which I know it sounds crazy. Yeah. But I've been trying to minister to some people in my hometown um, that are in this group. So my question that would help me to maybe help them is, are modern, are the modern-day Jews the same as the Jews that we read in the Bible? And how would we trace that to show that? And thank you so much. Sure thing. And, and thanks for the kind words, Caleb. Okay. Do you have my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People? I do not, but I'm— I'm aware of it. Yeah, let me encourage you to get it. Make sure you get the new edition that came out in 2019. The original is is 1992, but we updated, expanded it in 2019. So make sure you check that out. I do have a section where I deal with some of these uh, uh, lies and misstatements and misinformation, and I give some references to DNA and historical data that's helpful. So you'll find some really good material in that, okay? Our hands are stained with blood. You'll find some useful material there. But uh, today's Jews, which would include people like me, we are directly connected to the Jewish people of the Bible, but not exclusively. What I mean is that there has been intermarriage and there has been conversion from other people groups into the Jewish people, just like Ruth got added in as a Moabite, or, or Moses married a Cushite woman, she gets added in. So where Jews have stayed for long periods of time, uh, so say in, in, in Africa, or in India, or in China, or in Europe, uh, there's going to be a lot of conversion from the people around them marrying into the Jewish people. If you marry out, right, if a Jewish person stops practicing Judaism, marries into the larger world around them, then they completely assimilate, right? So within a a few generations, there's no knowledge of their Jewish history that's just gone. But if someone converts, like Ruth joining the people of Israel, or someone in modern history converting to Judaism, and now they marry in, well, if you have enough of the surrounding people that marry in, you're going to start to look like the surrounding people. That's why you have white Jews and black Jews and, and, and Asian Jews and things like that, whereas... Originally, you would have had Middle Eastern Jews, more more like brown Jews. 
So we can trace things back, but there has been intermarriage in. <clears throat> and how can you trace it back? Well, you can trace it back with DNA. That's, that's one large way that you can. For example, uh, descendants of Aaron had a certain DNA that was traceable. We call it a priestly DNA. And you can find it in, say, Ashkenazi Jews that have last names like Cohen. They, they can trace back to that. Or in Zimbabwe, the Lemba tribe. So here you have Caucasian Jews, and then you have, you have African Jews, Black Jews, and, and both of them can trace back genealogically, or excuse me, through DNA back to, to the Aaronic uh, line. So DNA is a part of it. Uh, the other thing that I would do if I'm ministering to people like this is I would use the exact opposite strategy, which I would say the whole question is, are you in Jesus? If you're out of Jesus, then you're in the flesh and you're going to die in your sin. If you are in him, then you are a son of God or a daughter of God, and that's what matters. And your lineage doesn't matter at all because they're caught up in lies. They're caught up in – the problem is that they have misinformation and you know, they have their sources for it, but it's all bogus. There's no substance. There's no fact to it. And what you could ask them to do is, well, you know, why not, why not get a DNA test and see how it lines up? You know, in my case, I'm 90% Ashkenazi Jew, 10% Sephardi Jew, but this can all be traced back. And if you trace back the origins of Ashkenazi Sephardic Jews, you can trace that back ultimately to the ancient people of Israel. But the problem is often facts don't matter to these folks. You know, it's a spiritual stronghold as well. So I would emphasize being in Jesus having that as one's identity and putting these other identities aside to try to set them free from their wrong thinking. All right? All right. Thank you. And I just give them the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's that's a key thing to do here, not get caught up in these other things. If they get saved and they're sincerely born again and now they're confused, then you help them. But yes, that's the best approach, which is what I was saying at the end, focus on identity in Jesus. 866 Three four eight seven eight eight four. Let's go to San Antonio, Texas. Crystal, welcome to the line of fire. Hi. Um, thank you for taking these calls. I love watching you. Well, thanks. You're so informed. Th uh, hey, so my question, um, I hope it's not a silly one. It's regarding Jewish astrology. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there was like a... Um, it was like a picture, I guess you could say, found in like an old temple that had shown it with like Jewish or Hebrew writing. And I was, I don't see anything in the Bible with that. And I'm just wondering, is that something that maybe the devil has like corrupted? I guess maybe God intended it, yeah. you know, for a different reason. Okay. It, it's, um, it's a great question, actually. It, it's a great question. So when most Christians think of astrology today, you know, they, they think of a horoscope or something like that, or, oh, I was born in this month or under this sign, right. and it has this symbolism, and we just completely dismiss it as, as either imagined or demonic. There is right. a place of astrology, not in that same way, not in the hip way, oh, I'm a Pisces, right, right. I'm a this or that, but that, that the astrological signs do have certain significance. Uh, you know, you would have astrological signs for different months of the year uh, in, in Judaism, and, uh, you know, uh, so, so there was, I don't, personally, I don't believe Satan corrupted a good thing. I, I, I don't think there was ever anything oh, to okay. it. Um, in other words, this, what Satan corrupted, I don't think was, was good to start, right? But the way it is found in certain aspects of Judaism, it's not like modern astrology, as you know, but there is more of a sense of the the constellations, the stars, that, that they, they are symbols or signs or are, are related to human life a little bit more. So right. I, I would say it's kind of in between our view, which is to completely discount it as, you know, forget astrology. In between right. that and the modern check your horoscope every day, it's kind of an in-between oh, thing yeah. saying like in creation, God established these things. And, you know, Genesis 1.14 says that the stars, this, the sun, the moon, these things are for times and seasons. And one of the words used there in Hebrew is moadim, which is the appointed times. So many would say that, right. that God put them there uh, 
to tell us when to celebrate certain holy days and things like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so that would be more of the significance. Then from there, it's not that big a jump to say that they have other symbolic meaning and things like that. So Right, because I couldn't find anything on it, and I was just wondering if you might know anything about it. So that gives me good insight. Yeah, also, um, if, if, you, if you check out a Jewish encyclopedia, right, and then uh, this is an old work, but it's available free online, and it's it's got great scholarship for its day. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. Jewish astrology. Yeah, there it is. Astrology. If you if you uh, type in Jewish encyclopedia, and then a space okay. astrology. Oh, they they got heavy hitters here: Marcus Jastrow, Ludwig Blau, and Kaufman Kohler. These were some of the top Jewish scholars of their day. Yeah, so oh, they okay. they will get into it. Uh, they they will mention the the background and and where this comes in and things like that and to what extent you know it's just from the pagan world and to what extent it's it's recognized within judaism so great question i Mm -hmm. appreciate it not a problem thank you so much for your time sure thing all right 866-34-TRUTH we got some phone lines open excuse me if you'd like to call in uh yonatan in israel will get you on the other side of the break how's that but 45 minutes from now 45 minutes from now, 4.15 Eastern Time. We'll be right back on YouTube, on our YouTube station, ASKDR Brown. Ask Dr. Brown on YouTube for our weekly exclusive YouTube chat, Q&A. Yeah, you get to post your questions there. So we'll be back on YouTube 45 minutes from now. All right, stay tuned. Is the Nicene Creed biblical? Well, if you mean that it affirms faith in God's eternal triunity, yes, it is biblical. If you mean, does it affirm the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Spirit? Yes, certainly it is biblical. And, and we see a statement in Paul's writings, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, where he brings this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there is a benediction, including Jesus, including the Father, including the Spirit. So we understand God's triunity. We understand Jesus saying, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. We see those things in Scripture. That being said, the Nicene Creed seeks to bring a philosophical explanation using the philosophical terms and concepts of the day and the world in which this was formed. So in that sense, it goes way beyond Scripture. It speaks of things in ways that Scripture does not because there were theological controversies that were being battled and there were nuances of interpretations that were at stake and there were deep, deep, deep divisions within the church. So in that sense, it goes way beyond what Scripture states plainly. And it seeks to clarify what exactly does it mean that Jesus, the Son, is begotten of the Father? In what way is God triune? It seeks to put philosophical terms on something that the Bible does not address philosophically. In that sense, it goes way beyond Scripture. In terms of affirming scriptural truths, the eternal deity of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and God's eternal triunity, yes, in that sense, it's biblical. In another sense, especially philosophically, it goes way beyond biblical language.
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday on the Line of Fire. Michael Brown, so delighted to be with you, genuinely, from the heart. Highlight of my day every day is to be with you on radio and wherever else you take in this broadcast, YouTube, Facebook, podcast, delighted to be with you. Here's the number to call if you have a Jewish-related question of any kind, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. By the way, just posted an article, if you're a Daily Wire subscriber, uh, just posted an article there titled, In the Beginning, The Real Purpose of the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, the real purpose of the first chapter of Genesis. I I think you'll find it interesting if you're a DW subscriber. Enjoy it. All right. Uh, In fact, I'm going to tell you a bit about it in a moment. But first, let's go back to the phones. Our friend Yonatan in Israel. Welcome back to the line of fire. I'm glad to be here, Mr. Brown. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. So I will start by saying I, I didn't reach you guys who sent me the email because it's it's a, a, a difficult a difficult issue for me to open out my my relation with God and especially in, as a messianic uh, Jew. So I will I will I will, but to, I I always happy to talk to you. Okay, but let me just encourage you. The the fellow that okay. that we connected you with, he's an Israeli. He's a Sabra. Uh, he spends hundreds and hundreds of hours with uh, with Haredi Jews, with Haredi Jews who are off the derech, so used to be ultra orthodox or not anymore. Uh, secular Israelis. So it's if you could talk to me, you could talk to him even more easily because he's got more in common with you. So just. Just to encourage, you know, he just he'll be a friend in any case. So, but, okay, yeah, okay. okay. I will think about it. All right, anyway, thank you. Yeah. So my question, I intended to ask this question uh, last week, but unfortunately, you didn't take any calls. Yeah. But it's still relevant because it's about Yom Kippur. Yes. The Day of Atonement. Mm-hmm. And and I last week was also about uh, the Day of Atonement, so I will. Leave that like the, the Jewish way of Day of Atonement. You cover up this week. I want to talk about how you, as a Messianic Jew, view and how do you what do you do on Yom Kippur? Yes, because Thank- because it, it, if you have cheese, okay? if if you right, yes, so you, you don't really need Yom Kippur. Yes, and yes. if if I'm right, so eventually we we, we don't need cheese because it's kind of contradictory to believe in Jesus and still have Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. Unless, unless so, you celebrate it differently. Let me, let me just ask you one thing, and then I want to answer you totally directly and totally honestly, okay? The fact that if okay. you read Vayikra, Leviticus 16, which lays out the regulations for Yom Kippur, and it focuses on, on the two goats, the one goat that's killed yeah. and the other goat, La'azazel, the, the one that's sent out into the wilderness— and you don't have those. You don't have the priest. You don't have the blood. You don't have the the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the or the Beit Hamikdash, the temple. Does that trouble you that the very central elements of the day and that everything is based on those elements? The the cleansing by the blood and the sending away of the the sins into the wilderness. That you don't have any of those elements. Does that disturb you? Well, if you ask me personally, or as an ex Haredi Jew, uh, because it's a little bit different. Yeah. Because, because for me, obviously, I'm not. I don't believe in God. I'm not an atheist because an atheist is somebody who is contradicts everything that uh, someone who believes in. So I'm not. I'm a Jew, and I practice Judaism on a regular basis. But I don't believe in God. But I can still have a opinion about. Young people and about Judaism because it doesn't make me not Jew if I'm not observer. Mm-hmm. And if, so, for me personally, of course it bothers me because 
the entire Yom Kippur, the entire idea of Yom Kippur, and even the Bible, so in the Tova, not, not even the Bible, the Tova, right. which is around 3,000 years ago. So, because we, we don't really have much about Yom Kippur besides the shedding of blood. Yeah, I know. I, I, I thought about it because the entire day of Yom Kippur is around blood, eventually. Yeah. And if you see in the Beit HaMikdash, in the, yes, the Tabernacle for 800 years, that was the day that mo- most Jew that uh, uh, was, was here, they came to the Tabernacle, to the Mishkan. In, in, and they came for one reason, to, to be a part of, of a tomb and in a blood ceremony, of course. It, it's all about the blood. It's yes. three, the three parim, how do you say parim? Balls of, uh, of Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. So one is, one is for the Kohen, the high priest. The second is for the priest, the entire priesthood. And the third one is for the entire uh, people of Israel, the, the Israelites. And every time he, he slaughtered the, the ball and he need to take the blood and he need to shed the blood on the altar and on the kaporet and on. So, of course, but it's it's funny because me as a, as a Haredi Jew, when I was in like Heidel, you know, it's uh, the Talmud Torah. Yeah. The kindergarten and like until the eighth grade. So, the, I, I sense that there is a conflict here, right? When the the Melamed, the rabbi, the teacher was talking about it, I saw, and in a young age, there is a conflict here. That when you read the Torah, you see it's all about the blood and not about blood atonement. This is how we were done. And yes, then you know you've been told, okay, just come back to Hashem, just regret about what you did, and there isn't really like a supplement for blood, but. Exactly. Again, this is what in and, and so Yonatan. That's what, let that me. Was in the, that's what in the, in, the, in the Torah. Okay, so if you jump a thousand years later, in the Talmud, when they didn't have, they didn't have Beit Midrash, they didn't have the lead, and so they tried to create some some other way of of uh, atonement. But the way I feel that when I was in Yeshiva and I learned the Talmud, is it, it, it's a bad supplement because they, they they cry. Okay, God, we don't have the the tabernacle, we don't have Beit Midrash, we can atone with blood. How, how, how do we do it? And eventually, they create this day. Okay, so now people, you come to the synagogue, you pray to God, you accept them as, uh, in Rosh Hashanah, you accept them as king, and you repent, and you, in Yom Kippur, you, you repent, and you, you get atonement just, just by doing that. So, yeah, it was... It's a difficult. It, it was a difficult issue to me as a kid and a teenager. Yeah. And, and, and how? How? Yes. Yeah, Yonatan. What I was just going to say was that, as I've spoken to different people over the years that were former Haredi Jews, it was the same kind of thing that they had questions, even as children, and something wasn't lining up in the system, but they felt they weren't allowed to question the system that this is how we do it, this is what we believe. So you could have questions within the system, you know, the shock levitari, the back and forth, the dialogue and discussion, but you couldn't have, you couldn't question the system itself. And then, of course, they end up leaving. What I'm saying is your questioning was absolutely right because Messiah came, because these sacrifices, the blood was all pointing to him, the one who would take our place, the one who would die for our sins. Again, to quote one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Isaiah 53, 6, Kulano katson ta'inu ishlidako paninu, vadonai hifgiabo et avon kulano. So all of us have gone astray. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, the, the Mashiach, the servant of the Lord, the, the iniquity of us all, uvachavarato nir palano, and at the cost of his wounds, there's healing for us. So, that this was all pointing to him once he shed his blood, once he died. We haven't needed those things anymore. We're under a new and better covenant. So for me, Yom Kippur is not a day where I seek forgiveness because I've been forgiven in terms of reconciled to God. It is a day when I especially pray for my Jewish people in synagogues around the world, that God would open their heart, that God would open their mind, that God would make them realize something's missing, that we don't have the goats, that we don't have the blood, that we don't have the atonement. So this is a a major, major theme. I pray for that, that God would open my people's eyes, 
to recognize their need for blood and that the Messiah is the one who shed his blood. It's also a time, though, because it's such a sober time in the Jewish community uh, around the world, even non-religious Jews become more religious then. I will also lay my life before the Lord. I do this often, not just at this time, but often. I lay my life before the Lord. Search me, God. Search my life. Uh, look at me. Is there anything displeasing? Is there anything dishonorable? But I, I do it as someone who has been forgiven, who has been reconciled. I don't, I don't need to hope that my name is written in the book of life for another year because Messiah's blood has been shed for me. And because of that, I have been cleansed. I have been washed. My conscience is clear. And in fact, I'll tell you this quickly. Before I was a believer, you know my story. I lived recklessly for a couple of years. The worst thing that I did was steal money from my own father. And I used to boast about it. And then when friends began praying for me that had come to faith in Jesus, I didn't know they were praying, but I started to feel miserable about the things I had done. We call it the, the conviction of, of the Ruach, the, the Holy Spirit's conviction. I started to feel miserable about these things. And when I came to faith in Jesus, I remember the night I asked God to cleanse me and wash me. And, and I acknowledged Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. I remember the guilt, all the guilt I had, it all disappeared. It was gone. I tried to find it and it was all gone. That's what happens once for all through the Messiah. Hey, let's just do this. Since you're on the phone, stay right there. Uh, we've got a break coming up, all right? But I, I just want to get your response on the other side of the break because you asked me the question. I want to get your response and see how I can be of help to you on your journey, on your spiritual journey. And friends, would you pray for Yonatan? Would you do that? Ask God, here, pray the, a prayer he could agree with. Ask God to open his eyes to the absolute truth, the absolute truth about God, the absolute truth about his life, the absolute truth about Jesus. This is a prayer we should all be able to agree with. Do that, Abba, for our friend Yonatan. Open his heart, open his mind. Lord, I think of the prayer of the psalmist, Uncover our eyes, open our eyes that we may behold wonders from your teaching, from your law. Do that for a friend, Yonatan. All right, we'll be right back to continue this discussion. And remember to join me 30 minutes from now on YouTube. Ask Dr. Brown channel on YouTube for our exclusive Q&A chat. We'll be right back. It's one of the Ten Commandments, but what does it mean? You shall not bear false witness. Friends, this is something tremendously important in God's sight. It is when we testify to something that is not true against a friend, a neighbor, against an enemy, against a coworker. It is when we speak falsehood against someone else. It is damaging. It is ugly. It is destructive. Many of us just think of doing this in a court of law. Many of us just think, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I haven't been called as a witness. But friends, we violate this sometimes on a daily basis. We post things that are just hearsay. We repeat things. We share memes that are catchy, but not necessarily true. We see something reported in the media, and if it's against someone we don't like, we go ahead and share it. We, we hear some rumors, some gossip. We repeat it to someone else. That is bearing false witness. We are called throughout the scriptures to speak the truth in love. We are told that when words are many, transgression is not absent, that we should have a filter on our hearts and on our lips, that we should be careful what we say, that we should be children of the truth, in the spirit of the truth, speaking the truth in love. Bearing false witness destroys lies. Bearing false witness can harm someone, and the harm can sometimes be irretrievable. When we post things irresponsibly, when we say things irresponsibly, when we get 
words out that are not true about others, it can damage them, it can hurt them, it can hurt their families, it can hurt their legacies. We must not bear false witness. If you're not sure about something, don't repeat it. If it shouldn't be repeated, hold on to it. Be jealous to guard the reputations of others and only speak that which is good and helpful and right and edifying. We must not bear false witness. Six, three, four, truth. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on the line of fire. Back with uh, Yonatan in Israel. Yonatan, I should mention that there are many Messianic Jews who will go to a Messianic synagogue on Yom Kippur. They will fast but they do it in solidarity with our people and they do it for personal soul searching and purification, but not to receive forgiveness the way the rest of the Jewish community would. And then others, like I said, my own practice is, is to especially pray for the opening of the hearts and minds of my people on that day uh, and thanking God for the redemption and forgiveness that I already have. So uh, because of Jesus, yes, it makes a massive difference as to how I relate to Yom Kippur. So what, what do you think of my answer? So, uh, again, it's an interesting perspective. And in a way, in a way, in Jewish teaching, this is what Messiah will become eventually, because in the uh, Chaye Ramabad, the, the next world, in the Messiah world, the Jewish Messiah world, we won't really be needed um, atonement in Yom Kippur. So Correct. It's exactly. It's different. And, exactly. And we won't need korbanot. We, we, we won't need sacrifices because we we don't need to shed blood anymore. Exactly. So it's an interesting perspective, but it's, I don't know how, many, how much time we have, but because it's, for me, it doesn't really add up as in my teaching of, of Yom Kippur in, in, in the Torah, of course, and in the days of the of the the mid Bet Mikdash, and because it's it, it's not in in the Torah that you know that God say okay you do this and you do that and every every uh, every specific has to be, to be in the same way you know he need to wear those clothes and he need to wear those clothes and he need to do this and, and there's nothing about but one day we won't need it because. Messiah will come. Or it's only it, it's in later tradition. The entire entire idea of Messiah and 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 him him saving us and atone from us is from later tradition. It's not in the Torah. Right. So it's, so the, it's not directly. Yeah, the thing that I would point so, out is is that the Torah has its purpose, right? In Jewish tradition, it's kind of the beginning and the end of, of everything. But the the the, the Sinai covenant had its purpose. And, and we failed. We failed repeatedly. So the 10 northern tribes, you know, the northern kingdom, go into exile. And then the, the southern tribes, then we go into exile in Bavel and Babylon. And then we come back, and then the temple's destroyed again. And then we've been, we've been scattered around the world. The, the covenant failed, which is why God said he would make a new and better covenant, which is why we need Messiah. If, if, if we would all just keep the Torah— and Israel would be observant, and and Kulan and Tzadikim, all of us righteous, then we wouldn't need Mashiach. The reason we need Messiah is because we continually fail. And the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, that's that's the picture of our failing and as to why we need it, a, a new and better covenant, because we failed. The covenant itself was good, but we fell, we fell, we fell. So now everything that was needed, atonement, making us right with God, the Messiah will do that. Because we're, we're going to keep failing otherwise. We're still going to fail. But this way we have redemption, we have forgiveness, and now we have hope of a, of a better life in Him. And it makes sense. You know, we haven't had the Beit HaMikdash all this time since, since Jesus came into the world and, and died. One generation after that, temple was destroyed. And God has been saying, hey, this, it's, the work has been done. The, the price has been paid. And uh, one, one last question, just... Um, well, r real quick, and then my big question. When, when you were, say, 14, 15 years old, uh, how many hours a day did you spend in, 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 in the, the yeshiva in terms of from prayer time to study time, 
Well, uh, how many hours a day were you engaged in this? Well, I was supposed to do around 50 hours a day from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. Right, and that was a normal when day. Yeah, that was a normal day yes. in your community, right? That much time studying, yes. praying. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that that devoted, and yet you had you had a conflict inside of you during that time. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So what what would it take for you to more deeply consider my position? I guess me being in a, in a certain uh, phase in my life because mm-hmm. it's a big issue. I lived from, I'm in, let, let's say I'm in the 20, early 30s, and I hope that people will believe I'm in all the 20s because I'm old. And because for, for, for a, lot, a lot of years, I was lost. You know, I don't know how much you were addicted to certain stuff, but I was addicted to drugs, Mostly weed, but still, and mm-hmm. gambling and bad behavior in general. And I didn't really have a time to think about, you know, God and about, and it took me a while, but from, let's say for four, four and a half, maybe five years, I'm more or less sober and I don't gamble and I'm straightening up my life, but it's still, it's still a, a, a touchy subject to Start searching God. Yeah, I understand. It, it it wasn't it wasn't a pleasant relationship, you know. Yeah. Well, well Yonatan, Yona, Yona let me really encourage you. You're, you're calling the show. You're always welcome to. Okay, you're absolutely always welcome. When I when I see your name come up on the board, it's like wonderful, my friend Yonatan. That means you're still listening. You're still here, and that means a lot of people are praying for you. One one day, hopefully, you'll find out how many people have been praying for you. I I just know it because of how many people listen to the broadcast, watch the show, and then love to pray for people just like you. So I'm sure you're getting a lot of people praying. But let me just encourage you, just consider opening the door a crack to to email our friend in Israel who reached out to you. And he's not aggressive. He's not, if you want to chat, he'll chat. If you, When he's in the land, I think he's out of the country right now. When he's in the land, just want to have a cup of coffee one day or something. Just a fellow Israeli, fellow Sabra, uh, that knows so many people with similar stories to you. Your own story is unique. Your own journey is unique. But just consider that possibility. In the meantime, keep checking out the broadcast. Keep watching our videos. Keep calling in with your questions. And we'll keep praying for you if that's all right. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one quick question. Do you have any book that translates to Hebrew? Yes, yes, I do. I have, I have a, a couple. Oh. I have um, the real kosher Jesus has been translated into Hebrew, and Volume Two okay. of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, where I deal with a lot of the subjects, the nature of God, the nature of atonement, things like that. That's translated into Hebrew. So if you, okay. if uh, we exchange the uh, email information, uh, if you tell us, if you email or tell us how to. Um, how to get you the books. We're happy to do it. Um, but yeah, the real kosher Jesus has been translated into Hebrew. And uh, I'll tell you what, because I have your, your email information, right? You gave it to us once. So I, 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 I have it. We didn't give it out to anybody except my one friend as, as per your agreement. I will, uh, I will email you personally. How's that? All right. I'm normally not able to do this oh, with great. radio. I will email you that's personally. Great. And by the way, that's- yeah. By the way, next year when you're in Jerusalem, yeah, I probably will try to meet you. You know, maybe even to just say hi. You know, because oh, that Jerusalem be, is not uh, that far away from from Lamad Gun. Okay, that that would be an absolute joy. Okay, so I will personally reach out to you, uh, Yonatan, and and then you can tell me how we can get the books to you. All right. So God bless. I've got to run. We're out of time, but thank you for the call. It's great talking to you. It was a, like always. It was a pleasure, and you know, last time we talked, you told you said it. You consider me about Plukta and Chavruta, and me too. And okay. we don't have to agree to be a companion in in, in Shakla Vataria. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm honored to have the companionship. All right, friends, let us pray for Yonatan.
God has kept him, God has preserved him, that God would open his heart and mind and reveal Yeshua to him. Oh, what a joy it will be. And my joy to 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 reach out personally. Okay. Um, hey, I, I promised I was gonna do this, so let me let me just do this. Uh, Italy's new leader says she is a strong supporter of Israel, considered far right, even fascist by her opponents. Yeah, by her opponents, Maloney. Uh, equates herself with the Republican Party in the U.S. and Likud in Israel. The Italy's likely, this is uh, from allisrael.com, great site to go to. Though Italy's next likely prime minister has been scrutinized for her right-wing politics, Georgia Maloney is a strong supporter of Israel, and despite her party being labeled by some as fascist, her victory does not worry the local Jewish community. Uh, last year, Maloney praised Israel at the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast event in Rome which another prominent politician called on Italy to move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, wouldn't that be wild? Wouldn't that be wild if Italy went ahead and did that? Whoa, that'd be big. That'd be very big for Europe. All right, friends, a little over 15 minutes from now, a little over 15 minutes, we'll be back on YouTube. Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R Brown on YouTube, the Ask Dr. Brown station. We'll continue with Q&A there. And once more, my appeal, please pray for Yonatan, that God would open his heart and mind. He's calling, he's interacting, and says, yeah, we can be partners in dialogue, even in the midst of our disagreement. So may the Lord open his eyes. And every other Jewish person listening, watching, may God reveal his son to you. <laughs> Get ready.